Hello and welcome to Infinity. And we're going to have some fun for the next half hour. We're going to be talking about a universal language, Esperanto. And maybe even learn a little bit so you can uh, greet your pets in uh, Esperanto. Our guest is Greg Wasson, president of the Esperanto League of North America. Greg taught himself Esperanto in high school at the library. And I'm going to have to tell you that story in just a second. But I have to tell you that every once in a while, someone walks into the studio for an Infinity taping and you have an automatic affinity with that individual. And so we really are going to have a lot of fun. Greg and I did not go to high school together. In fact, we never met before about two minutes ago, but you'll think we're old buddies, I hope. And I uh, hope you learned something too. Tell me the story of the library. You just told me that. That was the first thing that came up. Yeah, uh, I was about 15 or 16 years old and I was working one summer in the public library uh, near Santa Barbara, California. And uh, I was a bookshelver. And one day I was shelving books and saw a book called Teach Yourself Esperanto. And so I picked the book up, checked it out, and learned Esperanto <clears throat> over the period of the next oh, two or three months. And uh, that was it. I've been studying it ever, si ever since. Was that some kind of a cosmic experience, do you think? Well, I was you always... Did a book jump off the shelf and sort of land in your hands? Or... Uh, no, it didn't fall off the shelf or anything. Um, I... I had always been extremely interested in languages. I'd taken uh, Latin and Spanish in high school. And um, when I saw this, uh, this new, for me, a new idea, it's been around for about 100 years. But when I saw this book and s understood what, what it was about, the uh, purpose of the language, uh, it just fascinated me. Okay. What is it and where does it come from? Okay. Esperanto is um, a name which means one who hopes. Um, the man who invented Esperanto was named Ludwig Zamenhof. Uh, he was a Polish uh, eye doctor, uh, born in Bialystok, Poland, what, what is now Bialystok, Poland. It was then part of the Russian Empire. And uh, in 1887, uh, he came out with a small book called Lingvo, Lingvo Internacia, International Language. And uh, he had originally intended for that to be the name of the language. And uh, the people who spoke it found that too long and cumbersome, so um, they uh, it gradually became known as Esperanto. Mm -hmm. One who hopes. One who hopes. Yeah, because uh, you can remember that, but you couldn't remember that. Other right. Than, and it's real difficult to speak with a Polish accent too. Yes, so. it is. <laughs> uh -huh. um, you you taught yourself. But you have a uh, natural aptitude for language, so it's not as if anyone could go to the library, check out that book, and then. Um, two or three weeks from now be an expert in Esperanto. No, it helps. Uh, if you're an individual uh, who doesn't have an aptitude for languages, it certainly would help to take part in some sort of class. Okay, well, with other well what would be the practical application of it? Why would I want to learn Esperanto? Because obviously if I live in an uh, ethnic city like San Francisco, for example, there are a lot of, uh, there are uh, Asians that live here, there are Spanish-speaking people that live here, there are Germans and Swedes who come on vacation every year and all other sorts of uh, individuals from all over the globe, Russians and whatnot. Are they going to automatically understand what I say if I say hello to them in Esperanto? No, they will have to have studied Esperanto. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. It's not that easy. Okay. What's the point of it? <laughs> the point of it is to provide a politically neutral a means of communication with uh, other people around the, the world who speak Esperanto. Um, the goal, obviously, is for to for as many people as possible to speak the language to ease um, international communications. Um, in a practical sense, what you can do with it is, um, from the United States, where the population of Esperantists is quite small, maybe 2,000 tops, um, you can join local groups, um, you can carry on international correspondence. Um, the World Esperanto Organization has set up a delegate network which has representatives in about a hundred different countries and if you're a member of the association you have the uh, right to contact one of these delegates uh, say for instance about two years ago I went to Greece and uh, I wrote to the Hellenic Esperanto Association a couple of weeks before I went and one of the delegates uh, responded to me met me at the airport and showed me aspects of Greek life that I never would have seen as a simple tourist so they can provide very tangible uh, mm -hmm. help uh, if you're traveling overseas. Probably could do some great crank phone calls, too. If you yes, I'm to sure that. you could. <laughs> uh -huh. Why don't you say something? Uh, put your hand on the radio and preferably on the dial that controls the volume. Turn it up a little bit and let's listen to some Esperanto. Okay. Well, perhaps to, uh, I brought a book today. It's uh, 
Esperanto translation of Hamlet. Okay. And I thought I'd read just the first few lines of uh, the famous solilo soliloquy uh, by Hamlet in Act 3. Uh, the one that begins to be or not to be. Okay. Okay. Chu esti au ne esti, tiu staros nun la demando, chu pli noble estes al porti ciuin batoin ciuin sagoin de la colera sorto, au sin armi contra la tuta morda miseroi, cae per la contro staro in infini, por morti, dormi, cae neniu plu. Cae scii che la dormo tutti finis, dolorum de la coro, la mio batoin, heredon de la corpo, tiu estes tre deserinda celo, Morti dormi, tranquilli dormi, yes, sit ancao sonji, yen, yen est la barilo. Okay, sounds uh, to my uneducated ear as if it has elements of Spanish and Italian in it. Yeah, it's the vocabulary is based for the most part upon Romance languages with a smattering of uh, Germanic and Slavic roots as well. Okay, um, did this Polish gentleman, the eye doctor, mm -hmm. which is kind of fascinating, too, that an eye doctor would be involved in making up the international uh -huh. language. Did he have a lot of language training, obviously a Latin base? Yeah. Uh, he spoke, uh, in addition to Pol Polish, uh, he spoke uh, Hebrew. Um, he knew Latin, Russian, um, German, and some English. Okay. Um, I don't know that it has any relevance, but what about the story of the of the Tower of Babel, which is probably the opposite of what Esperanto is? Mm -hmm. Well, I've actually had people uh, argue against Esperanto uh, uh, to me using that story, saying that, you know, if God meant for us to speak the same language, he wouldn't have done that. I mean, it's very similar to the, uh, uh, the old story about uh, if God had meant us to fly, he would have given us wings. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, in the, what, what review for us, if you will, the story of the Tower of Babel? Well, according to the story, uh, the confusion of languages um, was brought about by God as punishment for mankind's arrogance. Um, the people all spoke one language, and they uh, built this tower, which God felt um, displayed arrogance and uh, showed that men were trying to be as gods. And they could only do this because they all spoke one language and could so cooperate with each other in a very easy manner. And so God wanted to put a stop to this, and so he made them so that they couldn't understand each other. And that's why we can't understand Polish unless we're trained that's in a language. That's right. Mm -hmm. So um, this language is, in, in a sense, is an artificial language in that it did not evolve over time based on geography. Right. Uh, it has evolved somewhat over the past hundred years. Some words have uh, uh, changed their meanings somewhat or uh, have uh, d taken on additional meanings to their original ones. Um, new words enter the language just as any other language. Really? So there is a kind of evolution. Huh. Is there a dictionary, a standard new collegiate Esperanto yeah, dictionary? Yeah, there is. It's called uh, PIV, La Plena Illustrita Votaro de Esperanto. I should have guessed that. Guess. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and it contains about a uh, hundred, uh, um, oh, maybe 125,000 uh, words. How does that compare with another language? How does well, that English, for instance, has maybe a, a million words. But obviously, few of us use those, and many are for specialized fields or archaic. Mm -hmm. Are there some words that you're aware of that have now gone out of Esperanto that have died? Uh, to a certain extent, uh, the early word for uh, ho hospital was uh, mausanuleo, which was a compound word uh, which meant a place for sick people. Uh, however, it's not a very international word, and the uh, word hospitalo has gained a considerable currency uh, over the fa uh, past oh, 30 years. Cause it's, it's more widely recognized. You said there are 2,000 people in the United States that speak Esperanto? Mm -hmm. Are there more in other countries? Yes. Um, Yugoslavia, uh, most of the countries of Eastern Europe have uh, much larger uh, Esperanto-speaking populations, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, all together around the world, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 million people who speak it. Concentrated, as I said, in Eastern Europe. Um, there are large groups in Brazil, the People's Republic of China, where it's also taught at uh, 13 universities. 
across the country. Uh, Japan, South Korea. And, uh, what about in those countries? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Eastern Europe, Japan, the People's Republic of China, South Korea, they have a different set of symbols. I mean, their alphabet isn't the same as our alphabet. Right. Is, do they just deal with the traditional alphabet as we know it in order yeah, with to... With the Roman alphabet, the yes. Roman alphabet? Right. Mm -hmm. Do you speak Esperanto with an American accent? Uh, I've been told that I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You've been in California long enough now. You probably have a California accent right. as well. <laughs> uh, my experience at international conferences where Esperanto is the major language spoken is that uh, many people do have some minor accents, um, but it n has never gotten in the way of communicating, which mm -hmm. is the whole point of Esperanto. Can you say anything that you can say in English in Esperanto? Uh, basically, I think so, if uh, you know the words. Uh, what about something like, and I'm going to use an absurd e example here, a far out man, this is a really laid back uh, conversation. That would be somewhat more difficult. I thought it might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, Unlike many languages that have purposes which are lost in history, uh, the original development of the language went on and then the character of the language became intertwined with the political aspects of the people who used it. And so some uh, languages seem strong or, or some language is only used for cursing and yelling uh, sort of thing. This seems to me, Esperanto seems to be a language with a purpose, that it was developed specifically for a purpose. Has it been true to that, the, the idea of international brotherhood? Yeah. Um, the idea, uh, in Esperanto, there's an expression, interna ideo, the inner idea or ideal. And this has been very important to the language uh, throughout its 100-year hist history. And it, the interna ideo, inner idea, indicates a... Um, certain way of looking at the world, of thinking about in terms of it, in thinking in global terms instead of uh, in purely nationalistic ways. And that's basically what that inner idea uh, stands for. And so people who are attracted to Esperanto are often people who um, share this ideal. Joan Margulis suggested uh, before we uh, began the interview that. Uh, People that are Aquarians uh, speak Esperanto. Mm -hmm. And you said, well, I guess that's true. Uh -huh. What's that all about? Well, as I, as I said, uh, people are attracted to Esperanto, not simply on practical grounds, or not always. There are some people who are. But um, they're attracted to it because of the idealism inherent in the idea of um, universal brotherhood and equality among the nations. And Aquarians are traditionally are supposed to be that kind of person. Does Esperanto have an application in another sense? Are there, uh, I'm thinking of uh, international banking community. Uh, are there any communities of that sort that are using it or the international scientific community? Mm -hmm. uh, one big project that's going on right now is in uh, the Netherlands, I believe. Um, the European Common Market. Uh, or economic community, um, is uh, developing a machine translation system using Esperanto as the bridge language within the neutral language within the computer. And because of the number of nations that are a part of the European economic community and the various languages, some of which have very little usage, like Greek uh, mm -hmm. outside of their own country, something like this is very necessary. And they picked Esperanto because of its um, logical nature and its uh, uh, regularity in, in terms of its grammar. The, the conjugation machine, of the verbs is very regular? Very regular, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have to say something. I'd like you to repeat it after me in Esperanto if you can. Okay, I'll This try. is infinity in San Francisco. Chitiu uh, estas san finezzo in San Francisco. Okay. Um... Is there any place in the world that this is a major language, a second language perhaps, a third mm, language, or third not language. really? Still a pretty mm, small fraternity. It's a pretty small uh, group. Um, 
there are, as I said, larger numbers in certain countries, um, but um, I can't think of any place really where you know you would hear it on the street every day. Is it just the American uh, ego that's involved in national pride, nationalism, whatever? But we're taught to believe that the major language of the world, discounting Chinese because of the, there are so many people who speak that mm -hmm. in within that country, but as you travel from country to country is English. And if you have English as one of your base languages that you can you can always get by. Yeah, I think it's, part of it is U.S. Uh, American ego. Um, maybe also fear um, of the unknown. Uh, you know, I've been told that over and over again, English is spoken everywhere. And it's true, if you want to deal with um, tourist agencies and people connected with the tourist in industry on your travels. But if you want to get to know other people, uh, you'll find that that uh, axiom simply isn't true. It's been my experience in my overseas journeys. For the those language, those people whose first language is a derivative of the Romance languages, it would be it would seem to be an easier language to learn in terms of pronunciation mm -hmm. and the formation of words and the grammatical structure and so on. What about for those people that are uh, from the Asian countries that mm -hmm. have a very different sound and a very different way of attacking the idea of communication? Um, well, certainly people from Europe and who have a romance uh, based language are going to have a certain amount of advantage in learning Esperanto. However, the Chinese, where um, it is, Esperanto is becoming extremely popular, like the idea because, one, the language is politically neutral. It's not associated with the United States or the Western powers or any one country. Um, and what makes Esperanto easy for them to learn is that it's regular. It's very logical. There are no exceptions to the grammar. And this makes it exceedingly easy to learn. Are there other publications besides Hamlet? Is there a, a growing library in Esperanto? Yeah, there are about 100 new books that come out every year, uh, both original, orig originally written in Esperanto and also translations for other languages. Hmm. What sort of a book would originally be written in Esperanto when oh, you could share Novels, with poems, uh, collect there are numerous uh, Esperantist poets who write exclusively in that language for their literary output. Um, and they come from diverse nations, England, Scotland, they're Chinese Esperanto poets. Uh, you use two words and you use them uh, what s seems almost interchangeably but not quite, Esperantist and Esperanto. Esperanto is the language. Esperanto is the language and Esperantist is uh, a person who speaks the language. Okay, is there an Esperantess? No, the f a female Esperantist would be Esperantistino. Esperantistino. Right. That almost sounds like a little Esperanto. Yes, it's not. Okay, it's a are female. There, are there masculine and feminine uh, nouns? No, there's no gender to the nouns, except natural gender. I mean, if you're talking about a man, he's obviously a, a, a masculine, but there's no gender to the nouns, grammatical gender. Okay, and is there any different pronunciation of uh, proper nouns? Or do you pronounce them, do you say San Francisco, or do you say San Francisco? Or uh, Generally, people uh, try to pronounce them the way they are in the language from which they're uh, apart. Okay. How about a little lesson? Help us out a little bit. We want to be on the, this is the first step that you learned in the Teach Yourself Esperanto course, except we have the benefit of an expert. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can tell you a few certain uh, uh, things about the language uh, that people have to learn right away. One, all nouns end in O. All adjectives end in A. All adverbs end in E. And so when you see a sentence in Esperanto, it's sort of coded grammatically. You don't have to guess what a certain word, what part of speech a word is, because the ending tells you. Okay, review that again. The O is? All nouns end in O. All adjectives end in A. All adverbs in E. So, for an example, the word for love, amo. If we want to make an adjective uh, such as a loving person, uh, loving would be ama. If you want to say in a lovingly manner, you'd say ame. Okay. Uh, verbs are regular. Uh, they don't change their ending uh, according to uh, whether they're singular or plural. So, for instance, I love is mi amas. You love is vi amas. The verb never changes. 
Mm -hmm. um, that's for the present tense. Uh, he loves li amas. We love, uh, plural, ni amas. And she loves? She amas. She amas. Yes. So we already know one word naturally. Yes. English speaking people know the word she. Right. That's great. Hey, okay. learned something already. Okay, um, any other, what about past tense? Another tense is a Past tense, yeah. Past tense, instead of the AS ending, is IS, IS. So I loved is mi amis. You love vi amis. The future is indicated by OS, mi amos, I will love. Mm -hmm. So it, you have a relatively uh, limited number of words in the vocabulary. You have a very regular system, which would allow you, after you've mastered the vocabulary, to... Uh, that's one of the things that I think sets back a lot of people that are moving into a new language and trying mm -hmm. to learn it, is the difficulty in understanding the irregular verbs. Right. Because they're all over the place in the uh, various tenses. Are there other universal languages? Yeah. Um, before Esperanto came out, a few years before it, there was a language called Volapük, which uh, was developed in Germany. And Volapük was, to a certain extent, based upon English, but it was very peculiar. Uh, it had numerous declensions, genitives, datives, accusatives, nominatives, mm -hmm. etc. And it made it very hard for people to learn, much less speak. Um, Volapük died out almost immediately when Esperanto hit the scene, because Esperanto was obviously superior. It was simpler people didn't want to have to learn all these endings um, and then a little bit after Esperanto there was a language called Edo and Edo was Esperanto based but it was made to be you might say more European so irregularity started to creep in so that it would seem more naturalistic mm -hmm. and not as contrived um, it is still spoken or used in magazines to a very small extent. There are only two magazines that I know of that come out in Edo now, and I think the movement's centered in Switzerland at the present How about time. Esperanto? Is there the Esperanto Daily News and the Esperanto... Yeah, um, there are about 200 magazines that come out every month. Um, some of the major ones uh, come from China. People's Republic has a very large, glossy magazine called El Popolo Chineo, which comes out once a month. There are various scientific journals or special in, uh, journals for special interests, doctors, lawyers, Catholics, Protestants. Hmm. How about broadcasts? Are there broadcasts available in Esperanto? Yeah, Radio Peking broadcasts every day in Esperanto for a half hour, I believe. Um, the Vatican Radio has broadcast every week. Uh, Swiss Radio does, and there are various other stations, uh, radio systems throughout Europe that use it. Is this a crusade? Is it, and it would the ultimate goal of someone like yourself that has devoted a great deal of time to the furtherance of the language and its usage? Is it a, a crusade to, for worldwide peace? Well, that might be stretching the point a bit. I think most of us see Esperanto, if it were adopted, as a means towards um, approaching peace around the world. I don't think any of us real, truly believes that if everyone spoke Esperanto that the millennium would be upon us. We're not that naive. But we do feel that Esperanto would pr provide a very simple solution to the global language problem. And if we can talk to each other um, directly and not have to deal with the way governments uh, tell us other people are. If we can talk with each other directly and have these, this open communication, then uh, that will create an environment or an atmosphere for peace. I bet there's somebody listening right now that has uh, attempted languages and had difficulty with them and said, well, what I really would like is another language that is regular mm -hmm. and that is as simple as Esperanto appears to be based on your preliminary description. Mm -hmm. How would one go about getting Esperanto in a school system, for example, if you wanted to have it offered as another language? Is that possible in the United States? Uh, it's possible. Um, you would uh, simply have to go to the school, to the principal, or start up a campaign to try and get it introduced. In the United States, there are maybe, oh, three secondary schools where Esperanto is taught. Um, and then there are classes at various universities, including San Francisco State University. 
Is that an accredited course? In yes, Esperanto? it is. Yes, it is. How long does it take one to become proficient in the language? Um, I would say after maybe three months, you could carry on simple conversations and you could certainly write, uh, correspond. Uh, for a really good um, understanding of the language and the sort of culture culture that in literature and tradition that lies behind it, you'd have to give yourself uh, a year or so. In English, there are a lot of words that have shaded meanings that can, when taken out of context, mean something the opposite and get a lot of people in trouble often. Uh, an example would be the, the word bad. And when some people say bad, they mean good. Yes. If something is really bad, that means that it's really good. Does that aspect of the language creep into Esperanto? Are there shaded meanings, and is there the possibility for misinterpretation? Words tend to be unambiguous as to what they mean. Um, but um, there are words that have certain connotations in certain contexts, like verdulo is a word that means green person, which uh, doesn't seem to have much sense. But Well, in, uh, if you make vegetables, yes. then, then I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, verdulo... Uh, in an Esperanto context, means an Esperantist because green is a color that's associated uh, with the Esperanto movement, as opposed to the Jolly Green Giant. Yes. <laughs> why is why is that? Why is green Esperanto? <laughs> well, apparently, I didn't know this, but green is supposed to be a symbol of hope, of springtime and rebirth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know. I guess it's a matter of, of perspective. Uh, in one sense, we could say, well, this thing really hasn't caught on like wildfire. It's been around uh, 100 years mm -hmm. and there are really a relatively limited number. But I guess then again, if you thought about the number of other languages on the planet, they've been around for a, a real long time. And mm -hmm. some countries, there are some languages that probably don't have a whole lot more people speaking them than, than uh, Esperanto, yeah, some true. dialect of Swahili or s mm -hmm. something like that. Is it a growing movement? Yeah, I mean, if you consider that in 1887, there was one speaker of Esperanto, Dr. Zamenhof, the inventor. And now, about 100 years later, there are approximately 5 million. And they learned the la language of, by free choice. They weren't coerced militarily, economically, or politically to learn it. Um, I think that's an astounding thing. Can you say bad things in Esperanto? Yeah. I hate you, and I think you're an awful person. Yes, you can say bad things but in the language. But you don't want to say those You don't things. want to. <laughs> <laughs> There's even Esperanto pornography. Really? Yes. Huh. Well, why in the world would there be that? <laughs> <laughs> the same reason there is in English. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd say that. This is Infinity. Remember to keep your mind open and listen to your heart. I'm Charlie Serafin. Thank you for listening.